Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. I am Sarah Atika and I will be your moderator and timekeeper for today's debate. Introducing our speakers, from the proposition we have Marsha Edina, Anis Afifah, Muhammad Afi, and Muhammad Alim Erfan. While from the opposition we have Nur Shafika Haifa, Nur Shaira Balkis, Naja Shakira, and Nurul Arisha. So each speaker will be given seven minutes to present their argument. Without further ado, the House invites the first speaker from the proposition. Okay. Am I audible? Okay. Thank you, Timekeeper. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good day to everyone. This is the debate of Group 1, which is my group, and Tengku Maimun, which is the other group, for the assignment for course Constitutional Law 2, Course Code Laws 2311, Section 4. So today's debate motion is the current constitutional framework is sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the state to make Sharia law autonomously without interference from the federal government or any individual or group. Now, we as today's proposition, Group 1, strongly agree with the motion. <clears throat> so before I start, let me first define the key terms of the motion itself. So the first term to be defined is the current constitutional framework, which can which can translate to the federal constitution itself. And some of the articles that would be mentioned is Article 3, Clause 1, which states that Islam is the religion of the federation, and Article 3, Clause 2, uh, which states that the head of the religion is the ruler of the respective state, except those states which do not have a ruler. The YDBA shall be the head of religion. The next term to be um, to be defined is autonomously, which is which is meant to which means with the freedom to act independently, and the last term to be defined is federal government or any individual or group which includes the federal government and also anyone, anybody that is not the state government or the state ruler. I, Masharidina, will be the first speaker from the proposition side and will be talking about Article 3 of the federal constitution as sufficient evidence on the independence of state rulers. The second speaker, Muhammad Afiq will speak on Article 71 of the Federal Constitution and how it supports the motion. Our third speaker, Anis Afifa, will be arguing on the clear distinction between the jurisdiction of the civil courts and the Sharia courts on Islamic law matters. And lastly, Muhammad Alim Erfan, our fourth speaker, will be elaborating on the existence of two governing bodies, which is the state government and the federal government, and the separation of powers between the, these two governments. So before I start with my argument, I would like to apologize if I have a list because my tongue is currently not in the best state. So however, let's move on and let me come to our first argument, which is that Article 3 of the Federal Constitution itself is sufficient evidence on the independence of state rulers in having the power to impose Sharia law in their respective states. As according to the article I have mentioned before, Article 3, the Federal Constitution provides for the power to impose Sharia wholly on the ruler of each state. Hence, we can see that it guarantees the power of the ruler for that respective state. The article can be read as it is, straight to the point and direct, which eliminates any opportunity for it to be interpreted any differently than it was intended to be. It shows that the lawmakers at the, at the time did not want a debate on the meaning of this article, which is another key evidence of the of the power of the state government being safeguarded and guaranteed. 
only for the states that are without a ruler, so Yang Mundi Putuan Agung instead becomes the head of religion, which does not actually eliminate the concept of the ruler of each state being the head of religion as these states, for example, Pen Penang, Malacca, Sabah, Sarawak, and also the federal territories do not in fact have rulers, hence their rights and Article 3 Clause 2 is not infringed. The freedom and the power of the ruler can be clearly seen in the implementation of Sharia law in each state. This can be seen in the statutes regard, uh, regarding Islamic law, of course, for example, Islamic Family Law Acts for each state. For the purpose of this debate, I will be referring to Islamic Law Federal Territories Act 1984 and also Islamic Family Law Kelantan Enactment 2002. The power to make these laws, which is the one that I have mentioned before, are of the ruler of that state as provided by Article 3, Clause 2. So for the Federal Territories Act, it is on the YDPA as the Federal Territories do not have a ruler, while for Kelantan, it is the Sultan of Kelantan. <laughs> To dissect every single detail of each law will be lengthy, even if doing so would be, concrete, would be concrete evidence on why the motion should be supported. However, to respect the time limit that we are given for today, I will point out only some. Simplest method to be observed in the legislations, the two legislation as I have mentioned before, is <coughs> the is that the Federal Territories Act has a, total, has a total of 136, se 136 sections. And 135. I am so sorry for the interruptions. Let me let me just move on. Okay. The simplest method to, uh, to observe is the legislation itself. The Federal Territories Act has a total of 135 sections, whereas the Klan enactment consists of 136 sessions. Though, yes, we admit the difference is little, however, that does not diminish the fact that there is still difference between the two which shows the freedom of each ruler to legislate as accordance to his dis discretion and that it is uniform for the whole federation. Hence, hence, it is prevalent that the federal constitution has indicated clear evidence on their stance on having the Islamic <laughs> law government by the state ruler independently and no other body which supports the motion of the current constitutional framework is sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the state to make Sharia law autonomously without interference from the federal government or any individual or group. Thank you. Thank you to the first speaker of the proposition. Now the House will invite the first speaker from the opposition. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. With the same motion that is the current constitutional framework is sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia law autonomously without interference from the federal government or any individual or group, we as the opposition strongly disagree with the motion. As the third speaker of the opposition, I will first rebut the argument given by the first speaker of the proposition team and second, present the opposition's first argument. Now, let us first look at definition put forward by the proposition team. It is incumbent to note that the proposition team had to highlight and define the most important phrase in the motion, that is, sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia law autonomously. From the phrase, the power referred to is the legislative power of the state to enact Sharia law. Whether the power of the states to make Sharia law autonomously is protected by the current constitutional framework will be a matter of contention in our debate. As the opposition, we believe that due to interference from the federal government, individuals and groups, the current constitutional framework is insufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia law autonomously. For 
understood that. In the first argument of the proposition team, they had erred in understanding Article 3 of the Federal Constitution by stating that state rulers have the whole and independent power to impose Sharia ah law in their respective states. This is because Article 3, Subsection 2 of the Federal Constitution further states that in any as observances of ceremonies with respect to which the Constitution uh, Conference of Rulers has agreed that they should extend to the Federation as a whole each of the each of the rulers shall, in his capacity of the head of the religion of Islam, authorize the Yang Dipertuan Agun to represent him. In addition, Article 3, Subsection 5 of the Federal Constitution further provides that Parliament may by law make provisions for regulating Islamic religious affairs and for constituting a council to advise the Yang Dipertuan Agung in matters relating to the religion of Islam. When the Conference of Rulers has a say, in matters pertaining to Islam, the parliament may make laws on Islam and the council constituted by the parliament may advise the Adi Pertuan Agung in matters relating to the religion of Islam. It is thus evident that the current constitutional framework is insufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the state to make Sharia ah law autonomously. Most importantly, based on the motion, their arguments shall not be on implementing Sharia ah law but instead in making and enacting Sharia ah law. Finish with the rebuttal. Now, the first argument of the opposition as to why the current constitutional framework is insufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia ah law autonomously is due to interference from the federal parliament. Before we go any further, it is incumbent to highlight that Sharia ah is defined as the sum total of Islamic teaching and system. Basically, Sharia ah law is Islamic law that governs Muslims' day-to-day -day life. It encompasses so all rules of Islam, including laws related to beliefs, morals and ethics, as well as sayings and doings of Muslims and their relations with others, which all Muslims are subjected to. In the current constitutional framework of Malaysia, the power to make Sharia ah is conferred to the State Legislative Assembly of each state. Article 74, Section 2 of the Federal Constitution provides that the legislature of a state may make laws with respect to any of the matters enumerated in the state list or the concurrent list. Based on the item of the state list, it can be said that states have the power to legislate on matters of Islamic law. This legislative power of a state includes enacting Islamic law for persons professing the religion of Islam in various areas. However, it is important to highlight that the term Islam or Islamic law in the paragraph does not refer to Islamic law in its entirety, but only to such areas of Islamic law as are explicitly enumerated in that paragraph. To support the contention, list 2 paragraph 4K gives the federal parliament power in relation to the ascertainment of Islamic law and other personal laws for the purpose of federal law. This means that some federal laws have an Islamic component over which the states have no monopoly. This clearly shows that the current constitutional framework is insufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia ah law autonomously due to interference from the federal government. For the purpose of this argument, parliament in enacting federal laws. This is because Islam is a full system of life that has its own laws on every matter. Although the state has the power to make laws on Islamic matters, there are limitations since parliament also has the power to make laws on matters that fall under Sharia ah law. It is provided in the federal constitution. Uh, in the Federal Constitution of Malaysia, that the state may not have the power to enact Islamic laws on matters enumerated in the Federal List. In the end, although Islam has its own law to govern Muslims on a particular matter, federal laws will always prevail, as provided in Article 75 of the Federal Constitution. Whenever there is an inconsistency between federal law and state laws, the federal law shall prevail and the state law shall, to the extent of inconsistency, be void. There are two major areas that clearly show that the states have no power to make Sharia ah law autonomously. First of all, in the area of criminal law, it is clear that Islam has its own law in regard to criminal matters. And pursuant to item 1 state list, state assemblies are empowered to create and punish offences against the precepts of Islam, except in regard to matters included in the federal list. Nevertheless, in the current constitutional framework, criminal law is a federal matter governed by the Federal Penal Code. Thus, the State Legislative Assembly cannot legislate on matters of criminal law. Next, in Islamic banking, finance and insurance, which are federal matters listed in item 4 paragraph K in the federal list. In Bank Islam and Adnan Omar, the contention that sharing of courts and not the civil courts have jurisdiction over Islamic banking was rejected. This is because banking, whether Islamic or conventional, is a matter that falls under federal jurisdiction, thus civil courts are the proper forum to settle disputes. Therefore, it can be said that although Sharia establishes guidelines for banking, investment, finance and insurance, federal law on those matters will still prevail as that matters fall under the federal list on which only the parliament has power to legislate laws. 
So, uh, in addition, Professor Shah Salim Faruqi stated that murder, theft, robbery, rape, incest, and homosexuality are all offenses in Islamic law but are clearly in federal hands due to item 4 paragraph H of the federal list and the federal penal code. State enactments on these federal matters will therefore be ultraviolet the power of the states. In Che Omar Cheso against public prosecutor, federal le legislation against drug trafficking was unsuccessfully challenged as being against Islam. Therefore, to conclude, we as the opposition believe that the current constitutional framework is insufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make sure in Allah autonomously since there exists interference from the parliament which also has the power to make sure in Allah based on the fair list. There are a billion other Islamic matters that are exclusively in the hands of the federal parliament. Hence, it can be said that state powers over Islam and Islamic law are neither exclusive nor comprehensive. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, for, uh, the first speaker from the opposition. Now the House will invite the second speaker from the proposition. Uh, hello, Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone. My name is Muhammad Arafiq and I will be continuing as the second speaker on behalf of the proposition that supports the current motion, which is the current constitutional framework is sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of states to make Sharia law autonomously without interference from the federal government or any individual or group. So before rebut rebutting the first uh, speaker from the opposition, I would like to highlight my points first. So one thing that could be agreed is that the constitution does actually provide a solid framework for the safeguard and guarantee of the power of states to make Sharia law. So as the first speaker from the proposition has mentioned, which is in regards with the relevancy of Article 3 of the federal constitution, itself is sufficient in, uh, evidence on the independence of straight state rulers in having the power to impose Sharia laws in their respective states. This is in line with my supporting argument that would be based on Article 71 of the Federal Constitution that talks about federal guarantee of state's constitution. So specifically, it can be seen under Article 71, subsection 1, that says the, fed the Federation shall guarantee the right of a ruler of a state to succeed and to hold enjoy and exercise the constitutional rights and privileges of the ruler of that state in accordance with the constitution of that state. So this provision shows that the power that the head of state holds. The relation between head of state and Islam is as mentioned earlier by the first speaker with regards to Article 3, subsection 2 of the federal constitution that mentions the head of religion is the ruler of the respective states except those states which do not have a ruler. The YDPA shall, have, uh, shall be the head of religion in those states. So it shows that in in each every state, the ruler of the state controls and exercises its constitutional rights by being concerned with enacting Islamic laws in those respective states based on the constitution of those states itself. For example, uh, as we mentioned, under laws of constitution of the state of Selangor 1959, which says that based on section 48, subsection 1, the head of religion of that state shall be his highness and his highness may cause laws to be enacted for the purpose of regulating religious affairs and for the constitution of Majlis Ugama Islam to it and advise his highness in all matters relating to the religion of the state. By this, it could be proven that in order for the states to enact Sharia laws, then the head of state must be advised by the Majlis Ugama Islam and it does not need authorization by the federal government. Furthermore, Majlis Ugama Islam or Fatwa Committee plays a huge role as well as they are seen as a body that handles religious issues in states in which their power could be seen in administration of Muslim law and enactment 1962 which is seen in section 37 that shows that if any civil court any uh, any question of Muslim law falls for decision uh, for falls for decision and such court requests the opinion of Majlis on such question the question shall be referred to the fatwa community committee which shall for on behalf in the name of Majlis give its opinion thereon and certify such opinion to the requesting court so adding on to emphasize on the power of fatwa committee, which is subjected by the power of state rulers in each independent state, it can be illustrated in the case of Dalip Kau against uh, Pegawai Polis Daerah, Balai Polis, Daerah Bukit Betajam, 1992, whereby in this case, the son was born and raised in a safe family, fully practicing uh, its faith. But later on, he had renounced his religion by converting to Islam. However, the mother argued that her son was no longer a Muslim after he had made a deep hole and was practicing safe faith. So the court held that they have complied with the Kedah Fatwa 
would say that if a person has not applied to any Sharia courts for renunciation of Islam, they are not considered to have converted out of Islam by the court. This is established evidence that shows states are independent into attaining their own ruling. So with all these examples of state provisions based on state constitution, this proves that the Fatwa com Committee or Majlis Ugama Islam holds an autonomous power without being interfered by civil courts as ultimately anything that is in regards with Sharia laws in Kedah had to go through the Fatwa com Committee as they are the body that would advise the rule of a state into deriving a ruling which goes ultimately which ultimately goes back to my supporting argument. So in rebutting the first argument provided by the first opposition speaker, I would like to highlight few points that should be taken, which the first point was based on Article 74, Subsection 2 of the Federal Constitution that mentions the power of Parliament to make laws in matters within the state list. So the first question that should be highlighted is what laws could they actually legislate in matters within the state list? which the answer can be seen in Article 76, Subsection 2, which mentions no law shall be made in pursuance of Paragraph A of Clause 1 with respect to any matters of Islamic law or the customs of the Malays or to any matters of native law or the customs of states of Sabah and Sarawak and no bill for law under that paragraph shall be introduced into either House of Parliament until the government of any state concerned has been consulted. As can be seen, yes, in the federal constitution, the parliament do have the power to make laws within the state list that is, which is undoubtedly. But however, it is still subjected to the state government based on their set of constitution, as they should be consulted first, which shows the power that the state holds in matters within Sharia laws, as uh, as laws could not be simply legislated or amended, as seen clearly based on Article seventy six, subsection two. So, in regards with the criminal law, most of the, the first opposition uh, clearly stated in the penal code. But however, Islamic laws plays a huge role in determining liability of those offenders as well, based on the Sharia principles, which can be seen in the recent case whereby two women were punished with public caning, which can be seen in the recent uh, uh, given by the Trenganu Sharia High Court as they have committed homosexuality, or in Islamic term, which shows uh, Islamic term, which is called Musahako. This shows that the power of states, uh, states court to impose punishment on these offenders solely following the Islamic or the Sharia court, Sharia laws as compared to punishment stated in the penal code. Thus, it can be seen that ultimately it is undoubtedly that the subjects being mentioned were based on the relevant provisions. But however, the power of states govern, uh, power of states governed by its own state rulers should not be undermined, as in regards with Sharia laws, the upper hand is sided on behalf of the states. Will be all for me. Thank you. Thank you, second speaker. Now I will be I, I will be inviting the second speaker from the opposition. Before I begin, may I check if I am audible? Ladies and gentlemen, to be autonomous, one has to have the power to govern themselves independently, entirely without needing to rely on some sort of validation or authorization from other bodies. Thus, the motion should fail today as there are numerous interference that hinders the autonomous power of the states to make Sharia law. Assalamualaikum and greetings, I bid the members of the floor. My name is Najia, acting as the second speaker for the opposition. It is our stand that the motion should fail as there is interference from various parties in the power of states to make Sharia law autonomously. So before I move on to my point, I would like to rebut some of the arguments brought forward by the second speaker of the proponents. Ladies and gentlemen, although the power regarding Islamic matters were explicitly given to the ruler of a state in the federal constitution, the Islamic matters at the end of the day are not absolute as it is limited to only certain matters as enumerated in the state list. This is as argued by the first speaker of the opposition, where the states have the power to make laws limited to only private laws or personal laws, when Islamic law itself is a holistic law, is a holistic law that covers all aspects of life and should not be limited to only personal matters such as marriage, such as betrothment or uh, maintenance, for example. Although the second speaker of the proponents argue that the head of state does not need authorization of the federal government in enacting Islamic law, we cannot say that this is autonomous power 
as it is at the end of the day still limited by the powers as mentioned by the first speaker of the opposition. And also a point to note is that when there are inconsistencies in matters uh, between the uh, civil court and the Sharia court, the high court, the civil court will always prevail. So in that sense, we can say that the power of the civil court is ultimately higher than the Sharia court itself. So we cannot say that the Sharia, the Sharia, uh, that the state has autonomy in matters pertaining to Sharia law. Thus, at the end of the day, it is entirely false to say that the states does have autonomous power to make the Sharia law. When the states are limited by the federal constitution itself as to what aspect uh, and what subject matter that it can and cannot adopt from the Sharia law. So, ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to my point in which the judiciary system in Malaysia limits the state's power to make Sharia law autonomously by limiting the state's subject matter jurisdictions and making decisions not aligning with Sharia principles as case laws. The legal system in Malaysia, ideally, is a parallel between the civil law system and the Sharia system, in which the two should be separated from each other but should be on the same level. However, this is only idealistic but it is not realistic as this is not quite possible to execute since the Sharia courts in Malaysia are only state courts and considered as inferior courts only on the same level with the magistrate and sessions court. So as mentioned just now, in the event of any conflict of jurisdiction or subject matter, the proceedings in the superior courts will prevail. Thus, the civil law would always prevail over the Sharia law in Malaysia. It also has to be taken into consideration that Malaysia practices a doctrine of stare decisis in which the lower courts are always bound by the decisions of the superior courts. So this interferes with the state's power to make Sharia law autonomously as they have to consider that their jurisdiction over subject matters is only limited to matters expressly delegated to them. St states can only be said to have autonomy in making Sharia law if their jurisdiction in subject matters are not limited. However, that is not the case in Malaysia. Because the Sharia court does not have the jurisdiction to hear most cases, the state legislature has to take into consideration that even though they might have laws on such matters, such as law on hudud and kisos, the Sharia court still cannot hear these cases. They can only make the, they can only make the law, but they cannot execute the law. So the state legislature has to take this into consideration when they are enacting laws. So that in itself is an interference to the state legislature as they have to consider what they can and what they cannot execute. Sharia law is not limited to only certain matters, as mentioned by the first speaker, as it is holistic and covers all areas of one life. It is entirely unfair for uh, the legislature to claim that they give autonomy to the state when they only give autonomy in certain matters and not in all matters. We, we can see that the state legislature does have power in certain matters. However, it is not autonomy. It is not in all matters. Autonomy should be all matters independent from everything. And Islamic law in itself is a holistic law. So, for example, Sharia law has its own set of law to determine one's liability in offences, such as what fits into the criteria of actus reus and mens rea of a specific offence. But in determining these elements of offence, the courts does not consider the elements in Sharia law, despite the states having their own statutes in this matter. For example, uh, Terengganu actually has their own statute on hudud and kisos. However, in these enactments, although it is stated that there are certain elements to be proven that is uh, also according to Islam, the judicial ruling in civil courts affect the Muslims, even though the enactment should be the one affecting the rule, the Muslims, as Muslims should be bound by Islamic law. So from here, we can say that the precedent and the case law deci decided by the civil court actually at the end of the day interferes with the Sharia court, with the state legislature decision in enacting, in enacting uh, a law itself. Because at the end of the day, they have to consider whether they have the power to execute the law or not. So due to these facts, we can see that the states cannot freely make law as they have to consider the execution of the law itself. So in the case of Siti Hasna, it is held that the jurisdiction of the civil court was not rejected on the sole basis that the subject matter of the case has an Islamic law element in it, when it is in fact regarding conversion to Islam when she was a minor. So this proves that states are limited by the court's jurisdiction when even if the subject matter is regarding conversion or rida. And in this case, it was decided by Hishamuddin Muhammad Yunus, judge of court appeal, that 
it is not the intention of Article 122, Clause 1A of the Federal Constitution. And the correct position in law is that only if the subject matter of the action is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts would the, would the subject matter, by virtue of that provision, by virtue of the article, fall outside the jurisdiction of the civil court. So, all in all, it is our stand that this motion should fail today as the state legislature does not have autonomy in enacting state laws. That's never been prouder to present. Thank you. Thank you, second speaker from the opposition. Now the House will invite the third speaker from the proposition. Am I audible? Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Anis Afifah binti Zarinzin, the third speaker for the proposition. And our third argument in favour of the motion that the current constitutional framework is sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia law autonomously without interference from the federal government or any individual or group is that there is a clear distinction between the jurisdiction of the civil courts and Sharia courts on Islamic law matters. I am aware that the previous uh, opposition speaker has argued on the same topic, but allow me to present a different perspective on the matter. To begin, Article 121A of the Federal Constitution provides that the courts referred to in Clause 1 shall have no jurisdiction in respect of any, mat of any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. The effect of this provision is that cases that fall under Islamic law, specifically matters listed in list 2, state lists cannot be heard in civil courts. However, how does this guarantee uh, the autonomy of the states to make sure our law. Under list two, state list, the states are conferred jurisdiction to legislate on matters over the constitution, organization, and procedure of Sharia courts. In short, this means that the Sharia courts are exclusively under state jurisdiction. By putting the Sharia courts under state jurisdiction, Islamic law matters remain within state jurisdiction. What makes it even more unique is that different states, due to sharing our courts belonging exclusively under that particular state's jurisdiction, would have different interpretations over the same subject matter. However, as much as possible, decisions and state enactments pertaining to Islamic law are harmonized. Placing Islamic law matters solely under the jurisdiction of sharing our courts allows for a more accurate interpretation of the law rather than letting civil court judges preside over cases pertaining to Islamic law. This is simply due to the fact that Sharia court judges are trained specifically in Islamic law and principles, whereas civil court judges in most cases are not. It would be odd to allow uh, non-Muslim judges to give judgment on Islamic law disputes. This ultimately protects the sanctity of Islamic law which the states have sole jurisdiction over. Furthermore, by providing a clear distinction in jurisdiction between Sharia and civil courts in Article 1211A, <coughs> there is no interference by an organ of the federal government, i.e. the judiciary, on matters under state law. Even if such were to happen, it could only happen in a case uh, it could, it could only happen in a case where a state law is found to be ultra virus or uh, to a federal law, federal law or concern cases of constitutional significance, namely uh, <coughs> conversion rights. By virtue of Article 75, in case of conflict between state and federal laws, federal law shall prevail. Ultimately, Article 1211A keeps the doctrine of separation of powers in place in the spirit of federalism. The second opposition speaker has had raised the matter of the application of Sharia law in Malaysia only being limited as only being limited to personal law and other similar matters when it should be wider, uh, as the concept of Sharia in Islam is comprehensive and encompasses all aspects of life. Rebutting this point, as our motion is on the current constitu constitutional framework, uh, therefore we will only be deliberating. Uh, from what is readily available in our federal constitution. And the fact of the matter is that the constitution has already provided the legislature with the tools to amend this, to amend this matter should uh, the need arise. The state list is not a provision that cannot be amended. Article 121, uh, sorry, Article 161E, Clause 2 
at, in paragraph C of the federal constitution states that no amendment shall be made to the constitution without the concurrence of the Yang Dipertua to an degree of the state of Sabah or Sarawak or each of the states of Sabah and Sarawak concerned if the amendment is such as to affect the operation of the constitution as regards on any of the following matters and in paragraph C, the matters with respect to which the legislature of the state may or parliament may not make laws. Thus, this provision shows Thus, this provision shows that the drafters of the constitution had clearly foreseen a situation where the state list would need to be amended should the need arise. Therefore, while it is true that presently the matters in which the state can make law is quite limited, um, i.e. only being limited to personal law um, in regards to Islamic law, it cannot be said that these matters are set in stone. At the same time, these matters cannot be simply amended either. In order to amend matters under Article 161E Clause 2, the, amend, the amendment bill must be passed by a two-thirds majority of the vote of the House as required under Article 159, as well as receive concurrence from the Yang Dipertua Negeri of Sabah and Shawa or either one of these states uh, which the amendment concerns. Thus, the strict requirements uh, to amend matters under Article 161E Clause 2, which includes the state list, uh, ensures that the parliament cannot simply am amend the state list uh, at their whim, so there is minimal interference. Hence, Article 161E Clause 2 has clearly allowed the parliament to amend the state list. Now, it is only a question of whether they will do so or not. So relating this back to my point on the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts, the Sharia courts may, may only deliberate on Islamic law issues as listed under the state list. However, as the state list can be amended, the Islamic law matters over which the Sharia courts have jurisdiction over can also be amended. Um, i.e. the Islamic law matters that they can they have jurisdiction over can also be expanded and added on to over time. On this issue, I do admit that it is ultimately up to the parliament to decide if the state list and by extension the matters over which the Sharia courts have jurisdiction over should be amended and added on to. So to conclude my point, there is a clear distinction in, in jurisdiction between Sharia courts and civil courts by virtue of Article 1211A, furthermore by virtue of Article 161E Clause 2, Paragraph C of the Federal Constitution, the matters over which the Sharia courts have jur jurisdiction can be amended because the provision allows the parliament to amend matters over which the states can make law, but this is subject to whether the parliament wishes to do so or not. That is all for me. Thank you. Thank you, third speaker. Now I will invite the third speaker from the opposition. Assalamualaikum. My name is Nurul Arisha and I am the third speaker from the opposition team. First and foremost, I shall start my argument by rebutting the points made by the third proposer. First, allow me to reiterate the points made. Firstly, with regard to the effect of Article 1211A of the Federal Constitution, it was argued that the cases that fall under Islamic law cannot be heard in the civil courts and it would be odd to allow non-Muslim judges to give judgment on Islamic law disputes. Yes, the points made are valid because it is expressly stated in the federal constitution. However, the pertinent question here is, is that truly how it is in reality? As we all know, Waqaf falls under the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. However, in relation to the judicial decisions, Waqaf is still, until today, being determined by the civil courts. The civil courts here are usually presided by judges who may not be conversant with Islamic law, which may lead to decisions which are contrary to the principles of Islamic law. It might be argued, well, a mufti can always be called to the court to give guidance. However, we must bear in mind that the civil court is not duty bound to follow the opinions of the mufti, as it can be seen in the case of Commissioner of Religious Affairs Rangano against Tengku Maryam. Next, yes, it is indeed odd to allow non-Muslim judges to give judgment on Muslim disputes, but in reality, there are cases where non-Muslim judges hear Waqaf cases. For example, the learned JC Amar, Amarjit Singh in the case of Majlis Agama Islam Negeri Pulau Pinang against Abdul Qadir, and also Judge Wang Tang Mac, Wang Tak Meng in the case of Majlis Agama Islam Negeri Pulau Pinang against Abdul Latif. Thus, it is proven that there is interference. 
Next, the third proposal has stated by providing a clear distinction in jurisdiction between the Sharia and civil courts in Article 121A, there is no interference by the judiciary on matters under state law. Yes, however, the third proposal had stated an exception and I reiterate, even if such were to happen, it could only happen in case a state law is found to be ultra-virus or federal law or cases on conversion rights. Based on the proposal statement itself, it is evident that despite Article 121A, the states cannot make laws freely since there will forever be issues raised in relation to the law being ultra-virus or federal law or to conversion rights, which is always interfered by the civil courts. This point is proven by the famous federal court case of Indra Gandhi, which is a case of unilateral conversions of her children. And the court affirmed that the civil courts have authority to decide Islamic law matters when constitutional issues are involved. And it declared that despite Article 1211A, it does not oust the jurisdiction of the civil courts, nor does it confer judicial power on the Sharia courts. My next point is, even though apostasy falls under Sharia law, the current constitutional framework is insufficient to ensure that the states can make laws on apostasy according to the Hukum Shara, which provides that the punishment for it is death punishment because the states are restricted to the maximum Sharia punishment as enumerated in the federal constitution. In addition, by virtue of Article 11, apostasy is usually associated with freedom of religion, which makes it legally complicated and raises never-ending issues and debates on it. It is proven that there is evidence of interferences from certain groups and individuals with regard to the matters of Sharia law, such as the Malaysia's infamous Christian convert, which is Lina Joy, who lost a six-year battle on Islam conversion case. Lina Joy applied to the court for various declaratory orders, to summarize, it is on how certain state laws were not applicable to her as she is now a Christian and that any laws that impose restrictions on conversion out of Islam were now and void being inconsistent with Article 11. When Lena Joy sought to nullify certain state laws pertaining to the Sharia criminal laws and Sharia laws, it created an unnecessary West interference when the liberal right activists interfered to pressure the Malaysian government and Lina Joy's case was covered widely in international presses such as the BBC. In relation to Lina Joy's case, the interference, pressure and criticism from the parties involved uh, proves that the states cannot make law autonomously without any interference. Moving on to my next point, by virtue of Article 74.2 and Item 1 of List 2, it can be seen that the administration of Islam that includes fatwa matters falls under the jurisdiction of the state. The fatwa, as we all know, is a binding state law upon the Muslim in that state and it becomes a binding law that shall be applied in the state Sharia courts upon being gazetted. Despite it is a binding law. There are certain groups or individuals who interfere with the state's power to make law by challenging the fatwa. For example, there is a women's rights group called Sisters in Islam which challenged Lango 2000, uh, 2014 fatwa which labelled the group that hold on to liberalism and religious pluralism beliefs as deviant from teachings of Islam. This interference by CIS was initiated through a judicial review and it was an ongoing case until 14th of March 2023 this year in which the Court of Appeal put an end to it by dismissing the challenge. Therefore, when groups like CIS keep on challenging binding fatwa, it creates unnecessary interference interference with states' powers to make laws effective and or operative. However, it is pertinent to highlight that if the Court of Appeal were to decide in favour of CIS, it proves that the powers of states to make laws autonomously is also interfered with by the courts. This is due to the fact that the court can declare the legally binding fatwa as null and void by a simple recourse. For example, this is also in relation to CIS, back in 21st February of 2022, the federal court held that Section 66A of the Administration of Religion of Islam State of Sunangu Enactment 2003 is unconstitutional and void as it is a provision which the Selangor State Legislative Assembly has no power to make. To conclude, the interference creates unnecessary issues which might last for a few years, be it nine years or six years, which prevents the laws enacted by the states to be exercised effectively. 
The opposition would like to submit that this interference by groups like CIS and individuals like Lina Joy, which also resulted in West interference, evidently proves that the current constitutional framework is insufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia law autonomously. That is all from me. Thank you. Thank you to the third speaker. Now the House will invite the final speaker from the proposition. Uh, Assalamualaikum to everyone. My name is Muhammad Alim Erfan, and I will be proposing the last key point to prove that the current constitutional framework is sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the state to make Sharia law autonomous um, without the interference from the federal government or any individual or group. I would like to start off with giving three rebuttals from the points given by the speaker before me. Uh, the third opposition speaker argues that most of the states in Malaysia use the uh, administration of Muslim law enactment, such as administration of the religion of Islam enactment 2003, uh, to create official positions for a state mufti that is empowered with law-making authority. However, I'd like to point out that while the states may have enacted legislation to empower state muftis, it is important to note that um, this legislative authority of these muftis is limited to matters within the scope of the state jurisdiction. The overall legislature uh, power still rests with the appropriate legislative bodies, such as the uh, state legislative assemblies. Opposition also argued that once the state mufti is appointed, issuance of fatwa regarding matters under Islamic law can be made. After the fatwa is published, it becomes a binding state law upon the Muslims in the state and it becomes a binding law that shall be applied in the state Sharia courts. However, let me just remind you that although fatwas issued by state muftis hold persuasive authority within the Muslim community, they do not possess the same legal standing as legislation passed by the state legislative bodies. Fatwas are seen as religious opinions and guidance rather than legally binding laws. And the last one I would like to rebut is that the third opposition speaker argued that the court can declare the legally binding fatwa as null and void by a simple recourse. Thus, it is evident that state does not do not have the power to make laws autonomously. However, we believe that the judicial branch plays a crucial role in interpreting and upholding the constitution. Judicial review is an essential me mechanism to ensure that laws, including fatwas, are, are consistent with the constitutional framework to protect individual rights. The court's power to declare a fatwa null and void is not an interference, but rather a constitutional safeguard to prevent any abuse of power or violation of constitutional rights. Now, I will be moving on to my last point for today, which is which will be about the existence of two governing bodies, which is the state government and the federal government, and how there are separation of powers between these two governments. The, federal, the Malaysian federal constitution in itself has clearly and precisely provided for the separation of powers in the Malaysian government. Article 74 of the federal con constitution provides for a division of legislative powers between the federal and the state. It has specified that the federal government has exclusive authority over matters enumer enumerated in the federal list, while the states have uh, jurisdiction over matters listed in the state list. Um, that being said, Article 74 must subsequently be read together with the federal list, state list, and also the concurrent list. But for the purpose of this debate only, we will be looking into the contents of the state list that mentions the power of the state, legis le state legislature in enacting Sharia, law Sharia laws. Clause 1 of the state list under the ninth schedule reads, except with respect to the federal territories of Kuala Lumpur, Labuan, and Putrajaya, Islamic law and personal and family law of persons professing the religion of Islam, including the Islamic law relating to succession, test state, and interstate, betrothal, betrothal, marriage, divorce, dower, maintenance, adoption, legitimacy, guardianship, gifts, partitions, and non-charitable trusts, which is wakafs, and the definition and regulation of charitable and religious trusts, the appointment of trustees and the incorporation of persons in respect of Islamic religious and charitable endowments, um, <clears throat> Zakat Fitra, Baitul Mal, similar Islamic religious revenue, mosque, public Islamic Islamic public places of worship, creation and punishment of offenses uh, by persons professing the religion of Islam. Um, all of this would be <coughs> except in regard to matters included in the federal list. Uh, Sharia courts shall have jurisdiction only over person professing the religion of Islam. So this means that the matters related to Sharia law fall within the jurisdiction of the states as they are listed in the state list. Furthermore, in respect to the state list, Article 76 also provides 
uh, states with the power to enact laws relating to Islamic law and personal and family law for Muslims. This provision grants states the authority to establish and enforce Sharia law within their territories without interference from the federal government or other entities. States have the autonomy to legislate on matters such as marriage, divorce, and all the <coughs> matters that I have mentioned before. And um, states also have the power to establish Sharia courts under Article 1211A of the federal constitution, which was elaborated by Sister Anis just now. And this only the courts only have jurisdiction over Muslims in matters related to Islamic law. They operate parallel to civil courts and are responsible for administering justice according to Sharia principles within the limits set by the state legislature. An example of the exercise of state legislative power in relation to Sharia law is the enact enactment of Islamic family law in various states. For instance, the state of Selangor has its own Islamic family law enactment, which covers areas such as marriage, divorce, and custody for Muslims residing in Selangor. This law operates independently within the state's jurisdiction and is not subject to interference by the federal government. It is important to note that while states have autonomy in matters of Sharia law, their legislation must not contravene the provision of the federal constitution, which includes the protection of fundamental liberty, liberties. The federal constitution serves as the overarching framework within which the states exercise their legislative powers, ensuring that any laws enacted by the states are consistent with the broader constitutional principles. In conclusion, the current constitutional framework in Malaysia provides sufficient safeguards and guarantees for the power of the states to make Sharia law autonom autonomously with their jurisdiction. The, the distribution of these legislative powers between the federal government and the states, as outlined in the federal constitution, allows states to enact laws relating to Islamic law and personal and family law for Muslims. This framework ensures that the states have the authority to establish and enforce Sharia law without interference from the federal government or any individual or group, while still operating within the limits set by the constitution. Uh, with the reasons I have provided, it is to believe that the current constitution, constitutional framework is in fact sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia law autonomously without interference from the federal government or any individual or group. Thus, we from the proposition team are for this motion. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the response for speaker. Now, final speaker from the proposition and from the opposition, the floor is yours. Am I audible? Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh for all the honorable audience and the worthy government. My name is Nushahirah Balkis Shahrul Nizam and I will be the last speaker of the side of the opposition. So with the same motion, now let us move on to the argument proposed by the side of the government. Uh, it was mentioned by the previous speaker, which he contended that the separation of powers governed by the provision in the constitution is the indicator of the sufficient safeguard and guarantee to the state and Sharia law. So ladies and gentlemen, although the state has its own jurisdiction given and enshrined in Article 74, Article 76, as well as the ninth schedule of the federal constitution, in many cases, they are overlapping regulations and contravening issues. So this can be seen in the case of Indira Gandhi Muto and Pengara Jabatan Agama Islam Pera and others, where the former husband Krishnan in this case claim was dismissed by the court because it was mentioned that Article 1211A of the federal constitution did not take away the powers of the civil courts the moment a matter come under the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. Furthermore, the court reasoned that the Sharia court is a creature of state law and does not have jurisdiction to decide on the constitutionality matters said to be within its exclusive purview and province. So only the superior civil court being a creature of the constitution can, which impliedly stating that the Sharia matter can be intervened by the civil court because uh, as this lingers on the conversion to Islam, the Sharia court is ought to be the one to given the authority to determine its validity. So although it falls under the state matter, the court in this case concluded that the convert's right were to be upheld through international rights and standard, as well as Article 11 and Article 12.4 of Malaysian Federal Constitution. So this case actually displays the real consequences of grey areas caused by the jurisdictional separation between the Sharia also as the civil in the Malaysian legal system. So although it was contended to be parallel with the civil court system, 
in most cases, the intervention would come from the civil system itself, which makes the establishment to contravene the dual legal system of law, thus sometimes making the power given to the state to be a toothless tiger. So with that being said, I would like to bring your attention to my material from the side of opposition. So my point would be the constitution framework does not clearly spell out the extension and limitation of the state's autonomy to regulate the Sharia matters and the punishment for its offender. So this is including the ambiguity in the application of any laws that would only be valid in a particular state. So even though all states are given the power to exercise their jurisdiction as stipulated in the ninth schedule, there are many affairs that were left out vague and uncertain which give rise to the society to question and challenge the validity of law interfering with the autonomy of the state to make law on its own. So the ninth schedule of the federal constitution in list two mentioned that it was under the state jurisdiction for the determination of any religious matter in general. However, the current constitutional framework only laid down this autonomy autonomy in general, leaving the states to regulate pursuant to the source of the jurisdiction given. So unfortunately, the power enshrined by the constitution has given rise to grey areas in many issues. For example, the inconsistency between the state's jurisdiction and the federal jurisdiction pertaining to the administration of private religious education schools such as Tafi school, Madrasa, Mahat and any private schools. Among the concerns triggering around the society is that this school can operate without proper administration uh, as well as uh, proper management by the state uh, where in this case uh, the children and students are exploited to collect donations instead of studying and learning, getting bullied by other students instead of concentrating on their education. So apart from that, the students are also exposed to safety risks due to the lack of proper equipment provided by uh, the state. So in this case, people allege that the religious authority of the state do not play their role accordingly as religious and Islamic matters are solely under the state. So according to the former Prime um, Minister of Education, Mahzid Khalid, calls have been made for private Tafi school to be suspended or shut down in the wake of many tragedies like the buildings caught in fire, like what happened to Darul Quran, Ittifakiyah and all such school will have to register with uh, the Federal Agency of Jakim Oversight. So from this statement, it could be seen that the religious affairs in education grounds are made not clear to whom jurisdiction should be because it is detailed in the list one to be the, under the federal but for private religious school, for instance, the Tafi school is under the Islamic Department of a State. So the uncertainty of the issue of whether private school are under the jurisdiction and regulation of the federal via the Ministry of Education or of the jurisdiction of the state. So the ambiguity of the jurisdiction has actually misled and confused the public, resulting them to blame the authority, especially the state, for all the problems that occurred. So this illustrates the interference from individuals, from groups, as well as from the federal government itself via their claim that hinders the state law to make the law autonomously. So among other issues that also been contested by the public is that the qualifications and a license of religious te teachings by any other religious teacher or speaker in any state which are limited to certain individual and cannot be applied and used uh, to teach in another state. So the constitutional framework does not actually provide a standard guideline and does not make it clear that one state's administration cannot be applied in another. So for instance, in the re recent controversial issue of uh, Ustaz Wadi Anwar, Ustaz Azhar Idrus that being suspended by the state authority, to give religious lecture in most in certain states. So people actually argued that it restricted the knowledge from being spread on the ground of procedures and formalities stipulated and demanded by each state. So although it was necessary to actually safeguard the religion of Islam, having an express provision would disable the people from criticizing blatantly. So any false narration uh, would be able to enter into society's understanding simply because the layman at large did not be exposed uh, that much to law and this is why the importance of actually constitutional framework to having a specific and clear-cut uh, distinction that can be observed in order to allow the state to work autonomously to combat any controversial criticism which is a form of interference from the public. So in conclusion, the current constitutional framework is not sufficient to safeguard and guarantee the power of the states to make Sharia law autonomously without interference from the federal government or any individual and the group 
because the autonomy given to the states is ambiguous and vague which causes and exposes the Sharia authority to be condemned, questioned and criticised. So it is recommended for the constitutional framework to actually clearly lay down the extension, limitation, restriction and the guidelines for the state in order to enable the state exercise its autonomy freely in relation to making the Sharia law. So all in all, uh, from this motion, we believe that this debate should belong to the side of opposition. Thank you. Um, thank you, final speaker. And thank you to all speakers for the brilliant arguments and rebuttals. With that, that's the end of our debate today. Thank you.